Yeah, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Dave Griffith. I work with Illinois uh, Department of Natural Resources, uh, Forestry. Um, I went to school down in Carbondale at SIU and went to work straight away at the UNR. I'm mostly in the northeast part of the state, northeast seven <coughs> counties. So um, a lot of my exotics, stuff that I'll talk about later, it comes from that especially. Um, so, uh, so I don't know everybody's level of expertise or knowledge of herbicides, so we'll start slow and we'll work from there. Very slow. So herbicide is a, simply a substance that is toxic to plants used to remove unwanted vegetation. And there's a bunch of different kinds out there to choose from. Um, but herbicides are generally broken down into two categories. We have our selective herbicides. So if you're talking, let's put it, I guess, in terms of in terms of war or combat. Um, selective herbicides are like smart bombs. They target something specific. They target grasses, broadleaf plants. Um, and and uh, so, um, sorry. So. Selective herbicides here are uh, triclopyr is, is a very common broadleaf and woody herbicide. It comes in two formulations. It comes in an amine salt, which is the Garlon 3A, the Tahoe 3A, and that comes in an ester over here, which is the Garlon 4, Element 4, Tahoe 4 leaves, and other generic versions. So in the future, we can hear me talking about the threes and the fours. The threes are water soluble amines and the pores are oil-based esters. So when you mix this herbicide, when you mix the amine, 3A is meant to be mixed with water, it's water soluble. Okay? The ester is oil soluble, it mixes with oil. Crop oil, some of the old timers use diesel fuel, I try to just use crop oil. But it's, a, it's an oil carry. Uh, this is another type of selective herbicide Crossbow, which is the ester mixed with 2,4-D. 2,4-D helps, especially with honeysuckle. Uh, then we've got our grass selective herbicide. So herbicides like Post, Vantage, there's another herbicide called Aus. It's very effective uh, when you plant trees in the, in, in the south. You can plant your trees, you can spray these herbicides right over the tops of the trees before bud break, and it will just kill the grasses. And they'll keep those one application in the spring, they'll keep those growing brown the entire growing season. And in Illinois, anyway, uh, if you're in the forestry program, uh, you're required to do that for the first three years of the tree planting, the first three springs. You use weed control to keep the grass, the grass competition down. The grasses cannot compete the trees for the water. And you can control them out. So that's why it's important to use a herbicide like that for, for tree planting. Then you've got your carpet bombing, your uh, glyphosate, which kills anything that's green. Um, and you got a bunch of different kinds made by a bunch of different companies at all kinds of percentages, different percentages of active ingredients. Um, if you buy the Roundup from the store in a squirt bottle, it's at about 2%. If you buy, I know Farm and Fleet in Illinois sells 50% Roundup out of the bottle. Got to read your labels to find out how much of that can be removed. Also, with glyphosate, it's, impo it's important to know that uh, glyphosate was shown to dissolve mucous membranes on amphibians near water. So, if you're going to use glyphosate near water, you need to use Rodeo, which is labeled for aquatic use. It'll say on the label whether or not, whether or not it's for aquatic use. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be anywhere near water, creeks, wetlands, anything else, think very hard about the herbicide that you decide to use. And I, uh, I'm a big safety nerd. Uh, I'm, uh, I run a chainsaw on the state's fire team, and it's safety, safety, safety all the time. Cap PPE, proper PPE. So proper PPE for herbicide spraying is uh, glasses, <coughs> gloves, chemical gloves, Long sleeve shirt, long pants, and at least boots. No sandals. 
shorts. <laughs> he knew the rotten chemicals were spraying. And if they get into your skin and get into your body, they don't do good things to you. <laughs> so it behooves you to protect yourself while you're using these chemicals. I mean, they can be very useful, but they can also be harmful if you're not careful. If there's any other further PPE required, other than the basic stuff here, it'll say on the label whether you use a respirator, all the, everything is on the label. Okay, so I guess basically um, one of the purposes, that, or one of the reasons why I like to talk about herbicides is because not everybody wants to fire up a chainsaw when you get into the woods. And using herbicides, you don't have to. You don't have to. You can do certain treatments where you don't even need to fire up a saw. You can kill it standing. Some some plants, and we'll talk about these later, require multiple different avenues. You need cultural treatments, whether it's pulling or cutting, along with chemical treatments, along with prescribed burning. You know, we'll get you to get on top. So it's some, a lot of these things, there's not just one you can have. There's going to be multiple steps to do it. So I'm going to go over <clears throat> three of the main ways of applying herbicide in the woods and their different benefits. So the first off is the, the easy one, foliar applications. Um, the benefit of foliar applications is that, is that you use low volume, uh, you use a low rate of herbicide, low volume on your spray. So you reduce overspray. You always have to be careful about hitting on target. If you're spraying a broadleaf herbicide like Garlon 3A, and you're spraying all your honeysuckle, and then you get it on some of the natives, it, I mean, it's going to kill us to get aware of what you're spraying. Um, plants must have healthy leaves, uh, healthy photosynthesizing leaves for it to be uh, effective. Uh, you want to spray, spray your leaves to the point of complete coverage but not to the point where it's hurting. This is very important for foliar applications. The use of an anionic surfactant increases the control that you get from the herbicide. It breaks the surface tension of the water. So there are certain plants where you spray it on, it just beads off and rubs off because of the wax coating uh, on the plants. Um, this, uh, the surfactant, Basically, as they say in fire, it makes water three times wet. So it spreads that water droplet out, and it helps penetrate that wax coating. And that will uh, help your control for sure when you're doing full application. The equipment's pretty simple. For foliar applications, find yourself a good backpack sprayer. Uh, so you can get a, a 25 or 30 gallon uh, rig on the back of an ATV, but that's got a hand sprayer on top and a little sprayer there on the bottom. Um, I'll tell you what, that's still backpack sprayer is amazing. I just got one not too long ago, and they work really well. They work really well. It's a four gallon. Generally, it still is a four gallon. Generally, you find them in three gallon packs. <clears throat> this is. Um, Cut stuff treatment is probably the one I use the most in the woods because uh, most people don't like, most <laughs> you have an aesthetic value of your woods, you don't want a bunch of dead trees just standing throughout. So, so cut the tree, cut the tree. The, uh, you, you cut the plant, you gotta leave a little bit of a stump. I wouldn't say any more than six inches of a stump. Uh, and then you treat that cut surface with an herbicide. If it's a small, if it's a small guy, you just treat the entire thing. Under two inches, you treat the entire, the entire stump. And if it's over that, you just treat the outer cambium layer like that. That's where all the action happens in the tree. That's where all the water, the nutrients are going up and down the tree. So that's all the, 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 the center stuff. That's all just support. Nothing's going on. You can apply herbicide, herbicide to that all day. Long. So you, you apply it on the outer ring. And uh, the nice thing about this method is there's no real right way to apply it. You can apply it with a spray bottle. You can apply it with a foam brush. I've seen guys where one guy is a head cutting and the guy's got uh, the wand is a little bit longer. He's got a sponge zip tied to, the, to where the nozzle is. So 
had sprayed a little bit, the, the, soap, or the sponge fills up with herbicide and you can dab it throughout the perimeter. You know, so, I mean, a little farm engineering can go a long way. As long as you're safe and not spraying everywhere, getting all over you, and, and doing what you want to do, it, it's uh, it effective. Uh, for cut stump treatments, there's a couple different herbicides that you can use to do this. You can use Roundup, 50% uh, solution of Roundup. And I'll talk a little bit more about solutions towards the end, percentage wise. And um, Tricolpyr is probably the most common, and you can use the threes or the fours to do this. Of course, you've got to mix 3A with water. You mix element four or Tahoe four E or Garlon four with oil, like crop oil here. You can do it. There's many different, depending on where you buy your herbicide from, they'll have the crop oil. If you, I, I get a lot online from forestry suppliers or benmeadows.com. Um, they have all the extra stuff. It's also important, too, if you notice, there's been a blue dye added to the solution, and that's very helpful. Uh, keeping track of what you treated. I think it comes in blue or red, depending on the Pathfinder, this is a, that's a, that's an interesting, this is a good one here. This one's already mixed with oil. This is Garland, or the, the uh, trifle here with uh, Esther, already mixed with oil. That's all ready to use. You can just dump that right in your sprayer and go to work without having to do the extra stuff. And there's a lot of herbicide formulations like that on the market. They all got fancy names. They all got, you probably find, you know, 10 different companies that sell a version of trifle here uh, with the ester. So it helps to shop around. Um, if you're in, this is kind of obvious, but if you're spraying in freezing temperatures, don't use water-based <laughs> herbicides. <laughs> they'll freeze. So, Use, uh, use oil based in the winter time. That's the best time to be doing any kind of cut stump treatment is in the fall, or the winter, because uh, the trees are dormant. So this right now is the worst time of year to do cut stump treatment because sap flow is coming out of the ground up to the leaves, to break the buds and produce leaves. So there's a lot of water being pushed up the tree. So you can cut the tree, apply the herbicide, and the water will just push right out and the herbicide. If you're using an oil-based solution, if you're using any of the fours mixed in oil, do not apply in temps over 85 degrees. Over 85 degrees, the oil starts to volatilize and the chemical uh, starts to break down. So save that stuff for the winter time, save the fours for the winter, and use the threes during the drug season. You can use them as a cut stuff, uh, cut stuff treatment, uh, or a full application. <coughs> But basal bark is the, is the last one. And, and the oil-based tricopyr is the herbicide to use for basal bark treatment. Basal bark treatment's nice because you don't have to fire up a chainsaw. You can just go out, treat the, treat the stem, and you're done. Uh, typical rates call for a 20% solution. You apply the herbicide from the ground level up about 15 inches all the way around the tree. For multi-stem uh, trees, all you got to treat all the stems. Um, it's kind of hard to see, I guess, but here you can see the these have all been treated here. You can see all the oil marks on the trees. Um, backpack sprayers are an effective way to go about this. Although I've seen people who have built contraptions with you know, foam fingers on they dip in a bucket and just use it to paint the sides of the tree. You know, I mean, that you can think of a hundred different ways to apply it. But the backpack sprayer is pretty easy. And you're going to use more herbicide this way. You've got a lot to spray all the way around the tree. If you've got multiple steps, that's good. You go through quite a bit. Um, dye will help track the treatments. And um, yeah, to be used in the fall and the winter this time of year, it's not as yeah, effective. Most of your woods work is done in the winter time. I prefer working in the woods in the winter time because you can work all day. There's no bugs, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you just have to worry about the cold. So most of the woods work, I, is, is any kind of cultural treatment, cutting, chainsaw work, 
herbicide treatment, I try to just save it for the winter time. Um, I don't know if you can see here, but the, in, the incorrect way here, the, the, basically they, they have their backpack pumped up too hot. There's too much pressure, so you see all the extra spray coming up and it's getting all over the place. The correct way to do it is just give it a couple pumps on the backpack and a nice low bottom. A uh, nice low bottom and go all the way around. So, I wanted to talk about how to apply some of this herbicide stuff I just regurgitated to all you folks. I, 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 and, and in the woods is the way I see it anyway. In my part of the state, in Illinois, we don't do much timber harvesting at all. Mark, we sold two timber harvests in 10 years. Most of the woods are sick, real sick, up by here. And it's old, mature, over mature oaks in the overstory, and then buckthorn, honeysuckle, garlic, mustard, everything else in the understory, shading everything out. There's no oak regeneration going on. So as these trees are falling apart and dying, because they're at that time, what's going to replace it? It's going to be a bunch of garbage, box elder and black cherry, that's all it's going to be. So a lot of work needs to be done to get the gears of Mother Nature working again. In my part of the woods, it's been about 50 years since all the farmers pulled the cattle out of the woods. So it's been 50 years for buckthorn and honeysuckle to become established in the woods. And they do. There's some old growth buckthorn. It's pretty amazing. Um, so I guess I, what I, as going through these, I, I, I need to make it very clear that one treatment is not going to work. You go in, you treat it once, and leave thinking you've done your job and, and you're a good steward, and then you go back the next time. And, it's all back, you know what I mean? You have to retreat. The first time you treat, you'll get 60%. So you gotta go back again and treat that remaining 40% where you'll get 60% of that 40%. You gotta go back again. So it could take upwards of three, four years, five years to completely get over this problem, but it's a big one because it's really screwing things up. This is the first big one that really ruins things up by me, is bush honeysuckle. Um, it shades out the understory and it prevents prevents regeneration from the trees that we want growing. So there's a couple of different ways of going about it. You can apply, it's supposed to say glyphosate here, I forgot to put that in here, but one and a half to two percent solution of glyphosate and water. And you can apply that to the foliage. The nice thing about this and buckthorn is that after first frost and all the natives start going dormant and dropping their leaves. Buckthorn and honeysuckle are still bright green, rocking and rolling. So that's the time to get in there with Roundup and start uh, spraying uh, foliar applications. Uh, you can also spray foliar in, uh, in the summer through the fall using uh, Garlon 3A or one of the triclopyr uh, amine salt, the, A, the threes. Um, if you want to go through and cut, you can apply uh, 20 to 25 percent solution of glyphosate uh, or with water or uh, triclopyrin oil, the 20 percent of the, of the pores. And the basal bark is just simply a, a 10 to 20 percent solution applied to the, the stem. Autumn olive is another big one. I know I just saw a nursery order from the mid 60s from Illinois the nursery where uh, the landowner ordered multi-floor rows and autumn olives. <laughs> so I guess, you know, we're just as guilty as spreading all this stuff. But, uh, but now it's a big problem and we've got to get rid of it. So foliar applications on autumn olive with, with shrubs less than six feet tall. If the shrubs are over six feet tall, just forget the foliar and, and cut it or do a major part. Because you won't be able to, you need to get the whole can Two to four percent of Roundup, or like to say, uh, one to two percent of the, the three A, the garland, uh, the triclopyrin, uh, the threes. <coughs> Cut stump is a uh, twenty-five to fifty percent glyphosate in water, or twenty to twenty-five percent of uh, water triclopyrin, either or the water or. Just as a side note, you can use a fifty percent uh, glyphosate solution too to kill trees if you're. Thinning out box elder, uh, 
doing TSI work in the woods. Uh, life saving. Uh, basal bark is again the, the, the core is 20 to 30 percent next to the oil. This one's a bad one. This one's a real bad one. I, I read a study from the University of Wisconsin, it was probably 07 or 08, that had thought where they had mentioned they thought that garlic mustard was interfering with oak growth. Uh, they, they found that garlic mustard has a, a liliopathic effect, a lot like black walnut does. But garlic mustard has been found to kill mycorrhizal fungus in the soil. <coughs> and oaks and mycorrhizal fungus have a very symbiotic relationship. They, the oaks give the, the fungus a place to live, and the fungus helps the oaks take up uh, water and nutrients. And when uh, mycorrhiza is removed from the soil, according to the study, it said it reduced oak growth by nine times. Should also explain the lack of complete lack of regeneration whatsoever in these woods. Uh, and uh, another biologist just forwarded me another study uh, last week about about a dozen other plants that they're finding uh, native wildflowers that garlic mustard uh, uh, because they also have a mycorrhizal fungus effect. The garlic mustard is a mycorrhizal fungus. So. We're talking about oak survival of the oak species in northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin, or eastern uh, Iowa. Garlic mustard's got to be one of the number one uh, plants to get rid of because it's pretty rotten. It grows in a complete monoculture. Uh, I was doing some work I, at Chain of Lakes. I have a demonstration area of what your wood is supposed to look like. <clears throat> and I did a lot of work over the fall and winter clearing out about half of this, thinning it out the way it's supposed to thin, proper stand, densities, and all that good stuff, just like the book said. And uh, that next spring, after I let all that sun on the floor, uh, I was treated to this, or to the, to the garlic mustard there. That it was, and I looked, and it was just, ugh, it's heartbreaking, you know what I mean? And uh, so I've been battling gar garlic mustard, and there's no easy way to get rid of it. There's just no simple way of doing it. It's usually a combination of pulling it, spraying it, and burning and spraying, and burning and pulling and spraying and burning. When they go to seed, they're a biennial. So the first year they act as a rosette, the second year they send up the flower and they go to seed. And uh, when they do go to seed, um, man, if you pick a if you pick a plant that's gone to seed, you'll hear thousands of little seeds hit the ground. And so uh, it's highly advisable also if you have garlic mustard in the woods and it goes to see you just stay out of the woods <laughs> because you, uh, you, you spread it pretty well. Uh, help, help spreading it through the seed. It, it, it's a really rotten plant and, uh, and somebody, and one of the settlers thought it was a good idea to put it in the um, But a good way, uh, combinations are here glyphosate, one to three percent. Um, glyphosate, glyphosate will not stop seed production when it started. That's kind of important because uh, the triclopyr, the freeze in water, uh, may prevent that seed production uh, from continuing once it started. Uh, pulling by hand is also viable control. I mean, it really kind of stinks to say it's an awful work, but it's, it's, uh, it's a tough nut to crack, that's for sure. Once it's in your woods, it's very tough. Multiflora rose is another one, the living fence or the nature's barbed wire, or whatever you want to call it, it's rotten stuff. It makes a miserable walk through the woods. I've always kind of thought uh, you, could get a, you could get an idea of a good wood <coughs> when you take a walk with your hands in your pockets and take a stroll through the woods. And most of the woods by me anyway, uh, that's inundated with buckthorn and honeysuckle and multiflora rose, it's just kind of this all the time, getting smacked and you've got to go in the car right by. Um, both of the multiflora rows, 2 to 4% glyphosate, and 1 to 2% of the trichopyr, the three in the water. Cut stem for the, some of the big stuff, the 20 to 50% Roundup, uh, or 20 to 25% trichopyr. And uh, basal bark treatment also works for the 20% of 
This one's another bad one too. It's um, up by me. It grows in solid stand like that picture you see there, and now underneath it's bare soil. I've never. It's really strange, but it's completely bare soil. It's dark as night, uh, and uh, nothing regenerates underneath my farm. Um, it's pretty pervasive, but I, and I'm not very familiar with with Idaho or Idaho, excuse me, Iowa or, or Wisconsin's plight of buffalo. I know it doesn't go too far south in Illinois. Um, but it, it's pretty rotten stuff. Um, one and a half to two percent of glyphosate uh, in water to the foliage is, is good. And, that, and the buckthorn's an easy one too. It's one of those that holds its leaves until almost after the first snow. So you can really hammer it while the natives are gone. The trees you can do it, uh, <coughs> the tribal fear uh, in, in the water. So, um, Cut stuff is to 20, 25% glyphosate or 12 and a half percent of four type of forest soil. And basal bark. Uh, you know, um, cutting this stuff is pretty rotten. I don't know how familiar you guys are with cutting cut buck on, but it's like cutting concrete. You get about two or three and you gotta sharpen the chain. It's pretty miserable. That's why I like basal bark treatment. You can kill it and let it let it cure for a <laughs> time before you cut it out. Uh, but it's really hard stuff. It's really hard. Um, as with everything when it comes to herbicide, just read the label. It's all there. All the information you need to know is there. If you need extra PPE, it's there. It tells you exact formulations for certain species you're going after. It's always there. So when you buy a new herbicide, just take the first 10 minutes and just look at the label, just to get acquainted with it, because it is uh, it is a danger. They are dangerous chemicals. They're, they're so uh, they, they good. it's good to uh, Explain yourself with that. Some helpful websites. I'll leave this up here for a second. I know a lot of these presentations will be posted online at a later date if you don't want to write them down. The top one's from Wisconsin, and the, the bottom one, or the, the lower website there is from Illinois Nature Preserve Commission. These are great websites. I think every state has pretty much got a, a similar website. But you can go in, you can search the exotic you're looking to, to uh, combat. And uh, it'll tell you the life history of the thing, the, the, the life cycle, and the, the control. So it'll give you an exact recipe of how to take care of these things. Oh, most of, a lot of these, uh, uh, all the chemical solution numbers I gave you uh, all came from the River to River Management uh, They're a team from Southern Illinois, and, and the publications called them Invasive plant of Southern Illinois, and it's a great cookbook, cookie cutter. Just read it and, and follow the instructions and, and tag it. The one thing with herbicides is you just have to be, or with, with the exotics, you have to be persistent. You have to be persistent. You won't get it the first try. You won't get it the second try. It's it's a it's an ongoing thing, and it can get to a point where it's just an easy maintenance thing. Where fire is a very cheap maintenance tool. So once you get on top of things, you know, you don't need necessarily need to break out the herbicides as much anymore where you can use something like fire instead to help keep things under control. Dollar for dollar and acre for acre, fire is going to be the cheapest tool you've got available uh, to manage your land. So uh, here at the end, I just wanted to give some quick mix rates so you guys get an idea basically of what I've been talking about. So if you break it down to 128 ounces per gallon, for a 10% solution, you need 12.8 ounces per gallon of active ingredient, whether that's going to be Roundup or uh, tricumpir and oil, what have you. Um, so, uh, and then these numbers are here just for a three gallon. So, I mean, you can do these numbers yourself at home. It's pretty, pretty simple math. Uh, but that's how you, that, that's how, so, when I say a 20% solution, that could be 100 gallons of oil, or you know, or 80 gallons of oil and 20 gallons of herbicide. You, you, you know what I mean? So just as long as those percentages match up, the volume is going to be increasing. Our volume. So, um, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. What do you like with the uh, tree planting uh, by green canary grass? Green canary grass is a well, oust, oust has been shown that it can control, uh, uh, it controls grass cities. Um, 
and it's been shown to do fairly well on eucanary canary grass. Generally, at, at work, when we're planting trees in the weed canary grass, we burn off the thatch. And in the spring, in the fall, and then in the spring, as everything starts greening up, we broadcast around it until it kills it. We just kill it. What about reed canary grass is uh, all over the bank of the pond? Well, then you can use glyphosate formulated for use around water, like rhodium. Rodeo is formulated for use around water, and you can attack that one. But it's key to get rid of that thatch because otherwise uh, it blocks a lot of the spray. So if you can burn it off in the fall and spray it in the spring, and just as it's coming green through the black, uh, that's the time to get it. And a lot of time with that, and there's another, some people call it common reed, some people call it phragmites, but it's another grass. It's really tall. It's like eight feet tall. And it's got a big seed head on top of it. it. Came from Egypt or something. And it's pretty good. It grows with big solid stems. And that's one of those that has really waxy coating on the stems. And so you would need a surfactant, not ionic surfactant, to help break that wax. <coughs> yes, sir. Oh, there's all different kinds. Um, there's one called Sidekick. C I D E kick. Um, if you go to something like Forestry Suppliers or Ben Meadows or even Conserve FS in Illinois, I think they're a big uh, herbicide. They're a big herbicide dealer down there. Um, they've got their own. You, you know, if you just ask for non-ionics or fact, they will know what they're talking about. You know what I mean? And, uh, um, it's the same with the dye. It's the same with the dye too. Yes, sir. What's the best deal? Prickly ash. Prickly ash. I would go, you can do it a couple different ways. You can cut it and treat it. Um, or you can apply a foliar application of, of uh, Garlon 3A or Tahoe 3A uh, or Roundup, depending on what's around it. You know, if it's a whole solid stand of it, then spraying Roundup's not so bad. But if there's other not target stuff in there, we want to be a little bit more careful. Too far to you or not good. It will, it will. Yeah, it will. Well, yep, yep. Yes, sir. Would a garland or would a mineral oil carrier work when you have a box oil and you know, a thousand and a half to run that for a while? No, no. This, this time of year when the sap flow is going, it's best just to do nothing until the leaves have come out. Once the leaves have come out, you know, and everything is returned to normal and then things start settling down, that's when the base of our treatment becomes. Any of it, it cuts down treatment too, uh, or basal bark, um, becomes more effective um, after, say, early summer once that whole, you know, spring is calmed down. Um, that would be the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, going back to the new tree planting, you talked about how to treat for um, tree planting inside. Mm -hmm. but is there something that's more of a drug we also have like uh, an annual weed drug in the world. Yeah. Is there nothing you can put on that before this? Well, before you go into, um, well, no, I wouldn't run anything other than house over the tops of trees. Otherwise, you would have to, how big is a plant? It's not like an acre. Oh, then I would go in with backpack sprayers, you know, probably in June. Or something, you know, once you start seeing the broadleaves pop up, you need to go through a spot spray with those leaves. But generally, the broadleaves aren't going to mess with the planting. I mean, if you start getting thistle in there, that's when it can become a problem. But generally, the broadleaves really don't do, they're not really that big of a competitor. Simazine, that, uh, yep, um, it definitely it takes care of the grasses for sure. There's been a bunch of studies done on the zine herbicides. The benzene was one that they got rid of. Simazine was another one. And uh, it's, it's pretty rough on the body, DNA-wise, you know, chromosomal-wise. So I tend to stay away from it. And I, I go with the house. And if you've got other issues, then I would go in and spot them as well. Yeah, what's the ester herbicide? What I'm sorry? Is ester, you know, mentioned oh, ester herbicide. O-U-S-T. Is that, is that a brand name or is that a type no, of herbicide? No, it, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the chemical composition of the herbicide. 2,4-D also comes in an amine salt, which is soluble with water, or an ester, which is soluble with oil, where you use oil. Is that the definition of soluble oil? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, but yes, for okay. for for um, for gen for this class, yeah, or for this speed, yes, exactly. So yeah, uh, I mean, salt is water, it's soluble in water. And esters are are are, are mixed with oil. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You have not mentioned toad out at all. Ah, I know. Uh, did you hear the talk out there just a little bit ago? Uh, well, you know, the, uh, the guy was out there uh, from Iowa DNR in that last talk he had out there. He mentioned Cordon. And he said, oh, people don't like it when I mention Cordon. Uh, Cordon's very nice, easy to use. It's all it's our Cordon RTU, which stands for ready to use. It's got a bottle right there ready to go. It's just been shown to move through the soil readily as compared to Garlon, to Garlons, or or you know, glyphosate, uh, it, it translocates to the soil pretty. So, you know, uh, if you're treating in areas that are, are that you feel sensitive, I'd probably stay away from toilet. If you're not using a whole lot of chemical, it's not like you're just spraying it all over the place, you know what I mean? You're, that's the point, is you're treating a very specific spot. So, in the grand scheme of things, does it make a difference? No. No, it doesn't. Toilet is a very effective. Works really well. <laughs> works really well for cut stump treatments for sure. <clears throat> yes, sir. Another basic you guys is uh, the wild grapes. Okay. We found the top of the tree to the Yeah, yeah. What's, what's the best way? Garland four with oil. <coughs> Garland four with oil. You <coughs> gotta be careful as you're treating the vine. You don't need to treat the whole thing. You're just gonna treat like the bottom 15 inches. If you're spraying, just make sure you don't get any in the tree that it's <coughs> inhabiting, because that'll so the oil will help it soak through and damage the surrounding tree. Cut it off for the oil. You can cut it. Yep, that was going to be my next. You can cut it and treat the stump with cordon or garlon. You can That's typically what they do. What we do. There's, there's so much of it in the ground. Right? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, the seed yeah, banks. The seed banks for some of these things are ridiculous. I mean. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you've got a lot of grapes, you're producing a lot of seed, the birds are eating the seed and spreading it all over your woods, you know, so it doesn't help. I mean, Gar I know, uh, by me, we have uh, the native, the native grape, the native wild grape, but in some instances it can get out of hand, really ruin it. But, you know, garlon, or it's a woody, it's a woody species, so you can hit it with the garlons, the three A's, but you don't want to climb up, get all the foliage. So treat it at the ground. I did a direct seeding of acorns this last fall. This one I'm going to name it some sort of herbicide cross that I'm thinking of using my right arm already as a granule. I'm wondering what the host that you said. Host or oust? Oust is another good one. And the price, I, mean, the, the, I used to recommend oust, but I only used to recommend contractor spray because oust used to be $700 per bottle. That's one of the it's cheaper now. It's much cheaper now. I think I, I, I've seen it online for as cheap as seventy dollars. Uh, online, online. Yeah. <laughs> so um, an oust is super effective. It, I mean, you spray a twelve, uh, twelve, uh, two foot band down the rows, right over the tops of the trees, and that'll stay bare soil for the entire row. It's, a, it's amazing. No, you want to do it before bud break, though, or before they, you know, before they pop. Because if you use oust, either it makes it too hot, or you spray it too late when the buds have already broken, you will stuff it through. You get little tiny leaves. So uh, timing. I mean, uh, and it is a pre-emergent herbicide. The oust is it's pre-emergent, so it has a little bit of a burn down effect if you've already got grass present. But it's helpful to do it early, 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 even probably now. And you want to time oust before rain. It sounds kind of counterintuitive, but you want to time it before rain to help to help get it into the soil. Yes, sir. Uh, for knocking down grass, I uh, try to have uh, agricultural vinegar. Yeah, you won't get the control you want. You won't you won't get the control you want. I mean, there's nothing that's going to work better than than Roundup. You, you know what I mean? If you're if you don't mind. Retreating, going back and retreating, then that's fine. But um, one of the things, especially in tree plantings that are like 15 years old or 20 years old, that have still that have raised canopies and have grass in their story, a lot of times uh, I've seen some old timers build it's like a big plastic shield with a handle on it. 
And they'll just go up to the tree and they'll set it up against the tree and they'll spray all the grass around the base of the tree. And uh, just to kill that grass, just to, to help out the tree a little bit. But, uh, uh, I just wondered if you could then you could spray any time of year. Right, and it would work. It just takes persistence and stuff. I mean, Roundup is kind of one of those uh, immediate satisfaction or immediate gratification or mistakes, you know what I mean? They even make it now where it, 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 um, it curls the, the leaf extra curly so you can see it working. So, I mean, <laughs> but a lot of times if you do basal bark treatments in the winter, um, a lot of times that tree will still leaf out in the spring. Uh, it won't make it through the year, but a lot of times, you know. And, and those three things that I told you, the foliar, the basal bark, and the, the cut stump treatment are just three ways of a hundred different ways to kill a tree. I mean, they make whole injection systems that you can do. They, you can just take a hatchet and hack into the cambium, girdle, girdling the tree, um, use a hacking squirt is what they call it. They just cut the cambium all the way around and then put a squirt herbicide in there, or even just girdling with a chainsaw. You go in about a half inch all the way around the tree, breaking the cambium with the water and nutrient uptake to the tree. And you can either treat that with an herbicide or double girdle it, and you don't even need to treat it. It'll, it'll re-sprout, probably, if you don't. Um, but uh, there's, so there's more than one, just the three ways I, I back, described. Back to the uh, early month of seed, you put an early age. Um, will fire kill that seed? No, it just make it better. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it makes it angry. <laughs> but uh, I, I've seen it just, uh, the most effective way I've seen is just a combination of pulling, spraying, and fire. And that is pretty much the combination for all three of those exotics. The big ones, the buckthorn, the honeysuckle, and the gnarled mustard. It's a combination of those three and continuing to do it. Doing it once won't do it. And, uh, you know, motivation is a big thing when it comes to land management because you feel proud once you clear out the woods and it looks good. And, you're like, ah, oh, you know, and and but if you make the mistake of not treating it or just treating it once, all that work has gone to waste. And it could be a soul crusher where you don't even want to go in the woods anymore. You know, oh, forget it. You know, I tried and I failed. You know, forget it. And I've seen landowners just do that and just forget it. I'm, I want out of the forestry program. I'm mad. And it's like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Any idea how long that um, from what I've read, they say five years. I don't think they really know. Um, but if, how long does garlic mustard seed persist in the seed bed? Too long. Too long. Is the right answer. Yes, sir? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's hard to pull when it's at that rosette stage in the first year. Um, but the nice thing about garlic mustard is that it could be the middle of January and uh, it's still green as can be. Uh, and so you can spray Roundup on that in the middle of winter if, you, if there's no snow on the ground. I mean, so uh, it, it's an amazing, resilient plant, unfortunately. It just, uh, somebody actually thought it tasted good in the salad bag. You, you know? Because when you walk through a woods that's loaded with garlic mustard in the spring, it smells like a, an Italian bread, a bad Italian restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> it just stinks to garlic, it's just awful. <laughs> that's that bamboo that's going along the river bank. Now, I'm not as familiar, I know what you're talking about, but I'm not as familiar with, with that. Um, uh, but I've heard them talking about that in Southern Illinois a few years ago, so. Um, but I'm not. Yes, sir. What about uh, Canadian thistle? Canadian thistle, they make they make they make an herbicide for the detect that it's called Transline. The problem with Transline is expensive. <laughs> it's very expensive. It's a, it's a bottle where in your tank mix you'll probably use three quarters of an ounce to an ounce or three gallons, but you have to buy the bottle. It's like six hundred bucks. Um, is it in a prairie or a woodland? Prairie. I've seen guys, and the biologists that I work with would tell you that you would just do spot treatments and transplant on uh, this one. For sure. It would, but it does, but it doesn't work 
well. <laughs> thistle is a strange, especially Canada thistle is a strange beast. And, and Roundup will kind of curl its leaves a little bit and it'll look awful, but it'll be right back next year. You know, it's um, a trend line takes care of it. Yes, sir? Uh, 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 well, there you go, there's your building. Yeah, that is that. And you really want to do is you're not going to be able to cut that. Look, it's a little soft. It just cuts the water right out of the water. Yeah. 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 Honeysuckle, buckthorn, and autumn olive are pretty shallow rooted. And I've known guys that just go with their, their tractor with their bucket and just pop them out of the ground. And that's been pretty effective. And, uh, and, and, but, but then, let's say you do that in the winter time, right? So in the spring, then you gotta go through looking for any sprouts or looking for any root sprouts and treating those that come up. But you've got the majority of the work done by getting all those shrubs. Oh, only you can But you just, you're going to have to follow up. Does anybody else have anything? Yes, sir. Both. Um, man, I wish Brad was here. He, he works at Crown Vets all the time. Yeah. I have partial pressure and just wrapped it that way instead of ergonomically designed handles and it that Really? That's why they didn't kind of need the uh, two inches underneath the ground. What so was that called? Parsnip Predator. Huh. Parsnip Predator. <laughs> but, when I, but for Crown Batch, I'm not, I'm not sure what they're using at the beach. I can't remember off the top. Roundup would work, it's just not as effective as oh. You said here. here. Mm -hmm. I want to say it was an S. I, I tell you, there's. It doesn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. That, um, that's that's what it was. Trend, there's the trans line again. Yeah, you're right. But if there's just a, you know, it's just being persistent. It's just following up what you do. If you're going to spend all that time and effort for what, just make sure it was worth it, you know, and, and just keep going over and over. Because it can be, it can break your spirit, I guess. Uh, especially once you see, uh, you, once you've taken the red pill and you're out of the matrix, and, you, and a, lot, a lot of, a lot of people by me just look out their backyard and see green and think, oh, it's green, it must be good, you, you know? And uh, and then when you tell them, or when you walk someone to, to the who thinks they have a phenomenal wood, and you're just like, oh boy, you know? It's like, how do you break it? And by the end, they're just like, oh, what did I do? What did I get myself into, you know? And, but it's, you know, we caused all this problem, and so, you know, it's gonna be up to us to fix it, or live with it. Do you do a lot of management around uh, holes where fire is not a possibility? Um, hmm. Well, we've never tried to let that get in the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, we will really try and burn everything we can burn. Um, you know, burning the wood is easy. You know, more or less, you can just go into the leaf floor before ahead of time and blow in your firewood you know, that morning. Um, We've actually had some fires where we thought they had got we were burning a big blue stem near uh, some uh, townhomes where uh, some of the leaves on the side of them had gotten really soft. <laughs> 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 but everybody understands what we're trying to do, and um, and uh, it's never really been comfortable. It's never it, it, mostly it's just smoke. It's just managing the smoke. I mean, there are some, yeah, but there's a retirement home or, uh, you know, some on the dash, but we'll, we'll really limit ourselves to the stage that we do that. Um, 
But there are a lot of people that just don't want to burn because they are, for lack of a better term, afraid of the pot. You know what I mean? So the wood suffers for it, you know? I mean, oak hickory woods are fire-based ecosystems. They need fire to maintain themselves. If we remove that out, look what happened. All the exotics just flew right in. So um, kind of fixing a bunch of wrongs in the past and trying to get people to think differently about fire, how it can be a tool and it's not something to really do. You know what I mean? But that's a hard nut to crack. It's just a hard nut to crack to tell people to cut the trees or to shoot the deer. You know, it's the same same thing. You either get it or you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it takes, you know, you, you got to cut trees to get trees. You know, it, it's the same, you know, if you have fewer stems per acre, you'll get bigger trees. So if you have fewer deer per acre, you'll have bigger deer. You, you know, it's the same sort of thing. Thinning the woods, thinning herd, thinning, thinning fire. You know, it, it's all, but it's a lot of, you know, it, I was just talking to someone earlier up by Chicagoland area and the, the land is connected got pretty to you. you know, the lumber comes from home people and the comes from the grocery store and who knows where it comes from, you know, before that. So uh, it, it's it's a tough nut to crack, you know, people just don't like fire. Smoky was really popular. <laughs> it really worked, you know, it probably worked too well in a lot of aspects. But. Does anybody have anything else? Well, thank you guys.